Legendary Passages, Episode 107, Plutarch's Life of Theseus, Section 13, Tribute. Previously, after many labors, Theseus arrived at Athens, drove off the witch Medea, and was recognized by his father as the crown prince. In this passage, Theseus contends with the sons of Pallas, the Marathonian bull, and King Minos come again to collect his tribute. Long ago, King Pandion had four sons, Pallas, Nissus, Lycus, and Aegeus, who might have been adopted. Aegeus became king of Athens, and when Minos's son Androgeus was killed while under his protection, Minos invaded. The forces of Crete laid siege to Athens. To break the stalemate, Aegeus agreed to give seven boys and seven girls as tribute to Crete every nine years thereafter. Though his people sacrificed their own flesh and blood, King Aegeus never had any children of his own. Naturally, Aegeus's brother Pallas and his fifty sons assumed eventually they would inherit the throne. But when a foreign prince named Theseus was named as heir, the sons of Pallas declared war. Leos of Agnes reported to Theseus where the bands of rebels were hiding, and Theseus and his forces defeated them all. Meanwhile, for his seventh labor, Heracles drove the Cretan bull to the Greek mainland, where it eventually terrorized the people of Marathon. On his way to subdue the beast, Theseus was given hospitality by an elderly woman named Hecal, who promised to make sacrifices if he returned safely. Theseus captured the bull and sacrificed it, but Hecal had already passed away. Lastly, Minos had returned to Athens for the third tribute, and the seven youths and seven maidens were either to be selected at random or chosen by himself. No one knew if the Minotaur devoured them, or they starved to death in the depths of the labyrinth, but none had ever returned. The people were upset that their new prince could not have been chosen the last time, so Theseus volunteered for the tribute freely, because, according to the treaty, the tributes would come to an end if someone killed the Minotaur. Tribute, a legendary passage from Bernadette Perrin, translating Lucius Mestrius Plutarchus, Life of Theseus, sections 13 to 17. Now the sons of Pallas had before this themselves hoped to gain possession of the kingdom when Aegeus died childless. But when Theseus was declared successor to the throne, Exasperated that Aegeus should be king, although he was only an adopted son of Pandion, and in no way related to the family of Erechtheus, and again that Theseus should be prospective king, although he was an immigrant and a stranger, they went to war. And dividing themselves into two bands, one of these marched openly against the city from Sphetus with their father, the other hid themselves at Gargettus and lay in ambush there intending to attack their enemies from two sides. But there was a herald with them, a man of Agnes, by name Leos. This man reported to Theseus the designs of the Palantidae. Theseus then fell suddenly upon the party lying in ambush, and slew them all. Thereupon the party with Pallas dispersed. This is the reason, they say, why the township of Pellene has no intermarriage with the township of Agnes, and why it will not even allow heralds to make their customary proclamation there of Acoeti Leo, hear ye people. For they hate the word on account of the treachery of the man, Leos. But Theseus, desiring to be at work, and at the same time courting the favor of the people, went out against the Marathonian bull, which was doing no small mischief to the inhabitants of the Tetropolis. After he had mastered it, 
he made a display of driving it alive through the city and then sacrificing it to the Delphinian Apollo. Now, the story of a call and her receiving and entertaining Theseus on this expedition seems not to be devoid of all truth. For the people of the townships round about used to assemble and sacrifice the Hecalasia to Zeus Hecalus, and they paid honors to Akal, calling her by the diminutive name of Hecaline, because she too, when entertaining Theseus, in spite of the fact that he was quite a youth, caressed him as elderly people do, and called him affectionately by such diminutive names. And since she vowed, when the hero was going to his battle with the bull, that she would sacrifice to Zeus if he came back safe, but died before his return, she obtained the above-mentioned honors as a return for her hospitality at the command of Theseus, as Philorchus has written. Not long afterwards, there came from Crete for the third time the collectors of the tribute. Now as to this tribute, most writers agree that because Androgeus was thought to have been treacherously killed within the confines of Attica, not only did Minos harass the inhabitants of that country greatly in war, but heaven also laid it waste, for barrenness and pestilence smote it sorely, and its rivers dried up. Also that when their god assured them in his commands that if they appeased Minos and became reconciled to him, the wrath of heaven would abate, and there would be an end to their miseries. They sent heralds and made their supplication, and entered into an agreement to send him every nine years a tribute of seven youths and as many maidens. And the most dramatic version of the story declares that these young men and women, on being brought to Crete, were destroyed by the Minotaur in the labyrinth, or else wandered about at their own will and, being unable to find an exit, perished there, and that the Minotaur, as Euripides says, was a mingled form and hybrid birth of monstrous shape, and that two different natures, man and bull, were joined in him. Philochorus, however, says that the Cretans do not admit this, but declare that the labyrinth was a dungeon, with no other inconvenience than that its prisoners could not escape, and that Minos instituted funeral games in honor of Androgeus, and as prizes for the victors gave these Athenian youth, who were in the meantime imprisoned in the labyrinth, and that the victor in the first games was the man who had the greatest power at that time under Minos, and was his general, Taurus by name, who was not reasonable and gentle in his disposition, but treated the Athenian youth with arrogance and cruelty. And Aristotle himself also, in his constitution of Batieia, clearly does not think that these youths were put to death by Minos, but that they spent the rest of their lives as slaves in Crete. And he says that the Cretans once, in fulfillment of an ancient vow, sent an offering of their firstborn to Delphi, and that some descendants of those Athenians were among the victims, and went forth with them, and that, when they were unable to support themselves there, they first crossed over into Italy and dwelt in that country round about Iapygia, and from there journeyed again into Thrace, and were called Batieians, and that this was the reason why the maidens of Batieia, in performing a certain sacrifice, sing as an accompaniment, To Athens let us go! And verily it seems to be a grievous thing for a man to be at enmity with a city which has a language and a literature. For Minos was always abused and reviled in the Attic theaters, and it did not avail him either that Hesiod calls him most royal, or that Homer styled him a confident of Zeus. But the tragic poets prevailed, and from platform and stage showered obloquy down upon him as a man of cruelty and violence. And yet they say that Minos was a king and lawgiver, and that Radamanthus was a judge under him, 
and a guardian of the principles of justice defined by him. Accordingly, when the time came for the third tribute, and it was necessary for the fathers who had youthful sons to present them for the lot, fresh accusations against Aegeus arose among the people, who were full of sorrow and vexation, that he who was the cause of all their trouble alone had no share in the punishment, but devolved the kingdom upon a bastard and a foreign son, and suffered them to be left destitute and bereft of legitimate children. These things troubled Theseus, who, thinking it right not to disregard but to share in the fortune of his fellow citizens, came forward and offered himself independently of the lot. The citizens admired his noble courage and were delighted with his public spirit. And Aegeus, when he saw that his son was not to be won over or turned from his purpose by prayers and entreaties, cast the lots for the rest of the youths. Hellanicus, however, says that the city did not send its young men and maidens by lot, but that Minos himself used to come and pick them out, and that he now picked upon Theseus first of all, following the terms agreed upon. And he says the agreement was that the Athenians should furnish the ship, and that the youths should embark and sail with him, carrying no warlike weapon and that if the Minotaur was killed, the penalty should cease. This passage continues with the ship leaving under a black sail, but our next episode features the Marathonian Bull.